The world has gone wild, for that isn't the sound of rain. Those are fingers sprinting on the fast lane. It is not in the stadium. The lane is on the cell phone screen. Not a victor on the podium. It's just a bunch of texting teens. I must warn you before I proceed. That child, the world has already gone wild. Cell phones grab the eyeballs of these teens and smear that super glue of hers and brings these sticky things into her arms, never letting go. My name is Kayla and I'm addicted. To what? I'm sorry, what was it? We use our cell phones for pretty much everything. To check our emails, to turn off alarms, to set reminders, checking our exercise, scrolling social media, set meetings, make money, win the lottery. Oh yeah. And did I mention talking to pretty much anybody in the world, no matter the distance? And though all of these may add benefits to the quality of our lives, like all great things, there is a relative amount of negative consequences. And I believe that the biggest consequence of them all is how oblivious we are to being attached to them. Oh, hold on. I'm getting a call. So before we can dive into the consequences of phone addiction, we must first understand what exactly is a phone addiction. First, a cell phone addiction is an obsessive usage of a smartphone. The behavior addiction is often dubbed as nomophobia or the fear of being without a mobile device. There are over 3.8 billion cell phone users in the entire world. Virgin Mobile discovered that those 3.8 billion people are now receiving the quadruple amount of text messages and phone calls than they did a decade ago. It's like the rise of phone usage seems to have a natural necessity to modern life. Though access to a smartphone may make life easier by making information accessible, still the convenience comes at a price. These devices are made so that it's hard to put the phone down and companies are currently competing on who could win this addictive race through its colors, sounds, vibrations. The technology purposely keeps us engaged. Google design ethicist Tristan Harris even admitted that features like Pool to Fresh were inspired by slot machines and other casino games. These designers and engineers meticulously develop every aspect of the device to create fanatical users. But where did this all begin and how exactly did this invention come about? Well, we could take it back to the 1900s. German militants tested a mobile telephone device that was used on military trains traveling across the country through World War I. During this time, many other countries began working on mobile telephone technology, including the British, Americans, and even the USSR. Fast forward a couple of decades, companies like AT&T and Motorola were steadily creating a mobile cellular device whose original purpose was for people to be able to use cell phones and drive at the same time. In 1983, Motorola launched the first cell phone in the world, the Dynatec 800X. It was priced at a reasonable $4,000. 
I mean, look at iPhone prices. I mean, can you really compare? With this price tag came many great features, such as a 30 minute battery life while on the phone. It was said to be the size of a foot long from Subway. And however, despite this device being large and pretty chunky to users, the fact that it did not have wires was the most appealing factor to all of the consumers. Motorola then spent over a hundred million dollars trying to create the perfect mobile device. And yet the Dynatech became synonymous for many famous TV shows in the 80s. The phone's most famous appearance was in Wall Street, used by Gordon Gekko, and was one of the earliest and undoubtedly the most well-known exposure to early cell phones. So it wasn't until 1989 that the Motorola Microtech, a flip phone that was small enough to put inside of a shirt pocket, finally signaled the direction that mobile phones took today. The Mobiria City Man 900 was Nokia's first version of the phone, and it was really only available to people of a higher status. Later down the timeline, Samsung finally made their version of the hand phone in 1988. This particular design was a mobile phone that was officially made and designed in Korea. Its display was so small that text messages were pretty much impossible to see and only the dial numbers or incoming numbers were the only numbers that you were able to see. And after years of this brick phone, Motorola finally innovated into making a phone that was more so in the flip design aspect. The flip phone. There's an incredible yeah. freedom that comes with using a cellular yeah. phone. I got all my guys working on it right now. And once you've experienced it, there's no turning back. Now, through this special TV offer, you can receive a Motorola flip phone with Cellular One service for just pennies a day. Now everyone can enjoy the freedom of a personal cellular phone. You can make a call anywhere or get a call anytime. Hi. Stuck in traffic? Call and change that meeting before you're late. Yeah, Dan, let's change the meeting to 10. Change of plans? Call me if you need No to. problem okay. with the flip phone. Can't remember those directions? Just give a call. Okay, right on Oak Street. It's that easy. Got car trouble? I can't get my car to start. Can you come and help? Help is just a call away. Order today and take advantage of Cellular One's great service for just pennies a day. We'll even give you free evening calling and free weekend calling for six full months. So don't waste a beautiful day waiting for that call. Put it in your pocket or purse and make the most of your time. This offer is so convenient, you won't have to leave the comfort of your own home. Get your Motorola flip phone for the amazing price of just $19.95. Delivered direct to your door within a few days, ready to use. The name of this model was the Motorola Microtech. And this was the smallest and yet the lightest phone that was ever invented. And for a number of years, Motorola produced several comparable brick style cell phones. And prior to the Motorola's Microtech model, the majority of cell phones were large and frequently mounted in vehicles or carried around like briefcases. Many more years later, people started to see the debut of smartphones. And thus the IBM Simon was first introduced in 1994 and is regarded as the first smartphone in history because of its gadgets that include apps and a touchscreen. And although the very first smartphone failed to catch on, normal cell phones became more and more popular while being smaller and more diverse in their designs. And after the introduction of these smartphones and flip phones and slide phones, Motorola innovated once again. And different companies such as Apple, Microsoft, began to keep picking up on these key ideas. And from these inventions came the evolution of what we see cell phones today. Now there has been so many theories already created regarding the usage of cell phones and just the overall effects that it has on our social communication that can be applied to just social media usage alone. Social media offers a unique interactive platform which allows users to take a closer look of how we communicate as a social society. Social media does not require face-to-face -face interactions.
And though this may seem like it will become a divide for us, however, studies show that this honestly has made us become stronger. And it has shown that it has increased highly in interpersonal connections. But today we're going to look at several theories that are often linked to the addiction of cell phone usage and social media usage altogether. And these theories include the social identity model of individuation effects, the interpersonal and differential impact hypothesis, uses of gratification theory, and the media dependency theory. So this theory can help us explain different cell phone usage behaviors and why people are so drawn to the online networking platform. This theory also explains how we act as a group when everybody is anonymous. I mean, you gotta be honest, hashtag no face, no case is really a thing right now. And although most social media platforms allow the creation of a customized profile, no regulations exist about if these profiles are truthful or even based on real people. While most users seem to prefer to add their name, picture, and personal information to their profiles in order to interact with people they know in real life, it is also not required to do so. And also, due to privacy practices, it's even pretty much impossible for moderators to dig deep inside on whether or not these profiles are even true. Because other forms of social media, such as message boards, don't even require the creation of an account in the first place. A study of social media usage on college campuses found that anonymous postings have a notable amount of offensive or inflammatory posts. This is an issue tied to the individuation effects and could be a mechanism of social media that could contribute to addiction. Now these theories can be broken up into two different types of hypotheses. The interpersonal impact hypothesis and the differential impact hypothesis. The interpersonal impact hypothesis argues that by identifying that social media is more social engagement and less of a personal impact at its stake, that there is a better understanding of why people are engaging in social media. Since users can ultimately create their profiles to socially depict however they want to be perceived without the risk of any morals, there is essentially a two harm, no foul overtone to when it comes to social media engagement. And that is the exact reason that drives these users to these profiles in the first place. While there is support from the interpersonal impact hypothesis, there is also another introduction to a hypothesis that also explains why we are so engaged within these social media platforms. Similarly to the interpersonal impact hypothesis, this hypothesis also acknowledges the two components of personal risk and social risk. However, this hypothesis recognizes the perceivable risk that may be impacted by the media itself. In this way, they can engage socially however they want without actually putting their personal reputations at stake. The Uses and Gratification Theories was created in 1940s when researchers began to look into why some social media users choose to get their information from so social media forums and genres over others. And this theory also states that people seek out certain social media forms that best fits their psychological needs within that moment. Researchers also believe that this theory can easily encapsulate the motivations of these social media users and also explain the threat that it has to addiction. With the inclusion of social media in this theoretical framework, users have a access of a variety of platforms to suit their needs. If a user is more image driven, they will be best communicate through a platform like Pinterest or Instagram. But if a user is text driven, Reddit or Facebook may have better options to fulfill his or her needs. The uses of gratification theory also assumes that there is an active media consuming audience. However, a lot of these social media companies make sure that they have the most addictive type of social media platform so that their users can never click off of their website. Social media platforms compete when it comes to attracting users. For example, Instagram has been working to create features similar to what a user may find on Snapchat, <clears throat> Instagram stories, <clears throat> therefore trying to drive their users from Snapchat to their own platform. 
The media dependency theory was created by Sandra Ball Rockage and Melvin DeFleur. And this theory was originally conceptualized around the ideas of large social systems and the sociology, but now this theory can finally expand to encompass social media. Media dependency theories require both a social system and a media system. And the essential idea behind this application to social media is that the social and media systems are combined. This creates a unique take on the theory that a social system and a media system cannot live alone within social media. The media dependency theory also outlines three main frameworks for media dependency. And these include society versus media, media versus audience, and society versus audience. And users must engage within each of these smaller relationships in order to fulfill their needs. Similarly, this theory also lays out three different media needs. First is surveillance, or needing to understand one's social environment. Second is social utility, which describes the need to act in a way that is both efficient and significant within that social world. Lastly is the need for an escape or to get away from the social environment when one feels overwhelmed. Social media allows for users to fulfill all of these needs in some way. It allows people to be able to observe the behaviors and published personalities of others without them even knowing. Thus, it also gives users a sense of importance when their behavior seemed as liked or shared amongst their peers making the users seem like they have the most important things to say in the world. Social media also offers users an escape from face-to-face -face interactions and gives them a place where they can simply observe without contributing to any conversation, thus allowing them to fulfill the component of escape. The authors of this theory also mention the effects that media can have on consumers, noting the strength of the cognitive impacts of media. So overall, you can say that social media definitely defies these effects by demonstrating the power of agenda setting through trending stories, trending tweets, etc. Cell phone addiction can really have an impact on a person's physical and mental health, social life, and productivity. More side effects include physical health problems, Excessive use of cell phones can lead to physical health problems such as neck pain, back pain, headaches, eye strain, and sleep disturbances. Mental health problems. Cell phone addiction can lead to mental health problems such as anxiety, depression, stress, and loneliness. It can also impact a person's ability to focus, think critically, and remember things. Reduce productivity. Spending too much time on cell phones can distract a person from their work, leading to reduced productivity. Social isolation. Cell phone addiction can lead to social isolation as a person may spend more time on their phone than interacting with others. Cyberbullying. Cell phones provide an easy access to social media, which can lead to cyberbullying, causing emotional distress and mental health problems. Accidents. Using cell phones while driving, walking, or performing any activity can lead to accidents, and in some cases, even fatalities. That's why it is important for us to be aware of the dangers of cell phone addiction and to take the necessary steps to reduce the impact on our lives. It's been proven countless amount of times that the devoted smartphone use can negatively impact an individual's life much like gambling. I mean, like, come on, they literally admitted that the pool to fresh was just like slot machines. Phone addiction may lead to sleep deficit, lower concentration, creativity blocks, aggravated ADD, anxiety, stress, loneliness, insecurities, and this is just a start. And this is also just on an individual standpoint. So if these are the side effects that 3.8 billion people are experiencing, you can only imagine how that affects our culture in our society in our daily lives. To address cell phone addiction, it is important to establish healthy boundaries and habits. Cell phone addiction can be a challenging habit to break, but there are steps that you can take to cope with it, which includes Setting boundaries. Start by setting clear boundaries for yourself, such as 
limiting the amount of time you spend on your phone each day, or turning your phone completely off. Me personally, I like to turn my phone on Do Not Disturb and then end up turning it off in the morning times so I can get a good headspace before I start my day. Two, find alternative activities. Replace your phone usage with alternative activities, such as reading a book, going for a walk, or spending time with friends and family. You can also try exercising to not only clear your head, but to also work on your body too. Three, use apps to help you. There are several apps available that can help track your phone usage, set limits, and provide reminders to take breaks. Two apps in particular that I recommend for limiting your phone usage is Unglue and Break Free. A lot of smartphones have a feature within the phone that you can limit your time on certain apps. For Apple users, go to Setting, Screen Time, and Turn On Screen Time. This feature keeps track of all of the apps that you've been on and lets you set a limit for the amount of time used on an app. When you go past the limit, it will then provide you of a notification that you surpassed your limit and then will exit you from the app. Four, create a support system. Reach out to friends or family members who can help you stay accountable and provide encouragement as you work to break your phone addiction. Make it a challenge. Have days where you and your friends hang out and then lock your phones in another room. Five, seek professional help. If you find that you are struggling to break your addiction on your own, consider seeking professional help from a therapist or a counselor who can provide you additional support and guidance. Remember, breaking of cell phone addiction is a process and it may take time and a lot of effort to overcome. But with determination and the right tools, you can regain control of your phone usage and improve your overall well-being. And together, we can hang up the phone on addiction.